All right, Aspire Leaders and Teach Better family, thank you so much for joining once again this week. I know that in the spring, it is a busy time for all of our educators, and I'm just so appreciative that you would come here, listen to this podcast, and join my special guest, Jason Williamson. Thank you so much for being on Aspire to Lead. Absolutely. It's all my pleasure. I'm, I'm excited about this conversation. I've listened to several podcasts of yours and uh, it's a lot of good information that comes through here. So hopefully I can add my part to it and somebody might can get something out of it. Oh, I have no doubt in my mind that that's going to occur today. And Jason, for those who are listening or watching on YouTube and want to know a little bit about you, what would you say is your educational and leadership background? Well, I've been in education 20 years. I'm sure you'll do the bio stuff on that, but oh, yeah. I've been an educational leader in terms of being a building administrator for 11 years. And I was just blessed. I got an opportunity. One of my mentors called me one day and said, hey, man, we need you. We need more people. We need more African-American males in 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 leadership. And, and you have all the skills and the tools. So why, why don't you come and, and be a part? Uh, of our program here in Nashville, Arkansas, right? And so, and that was actually home for me where I grew up was Nashville, Arkansas. And and one of the things that my parents always taught me was be ready when your time is called. So I had already been doing the background uh, stuff as far as education to be prepared to be ready to be an educational leader. Uh, and, and I took that opportunity when I was an assistant principal uh, in Nashville, Arkansas at a junior high. That is great training ground, by the way. Uh, they, it comes fast and heavy, but that that was kind of my role or my journey to becoming an educational leader. And I had some of the best teachers there. Uh, Ms. Tackett, man, my gosh, she should be teaching other principals how to be principals, right? And but But the main thing she taught me that I take with me today is put students first. And we're going to talk about that some a little bit later in terms of my how I, my philosophy about uh, collective commitments, but putting students first is, is, is something that is, is very near and dear to my heart and who I am and, and how I lead. No, I love that. And that's probably a good segue to kick off our conversation with those commitments that you have. And I know it's something that drives culture within the building. And I think it's so important for us to kind of outline those for our aspiring and current leaders. So if you wouldn't mind just sharing those collective commitments with my audience, I think this is going to be a setup that's going to really amplify and help them in their leadership journey. Well, the, the just to give you a little background on how we got mm -hmm. to putting together the, these five collective commitments, we came into a building at Northside High School uh, at the beginning of last year that, that has some challenges. And you know how buildings can have challenges. And what we quickly figured out was we needed to have a direction that everyone could pull in and, and move toward. Vision statements and mission statements are powerful and they are needed, right? We needed things that people could go to immediately and lean on when they're making decisions, when they're in the, in the fire, so to speak. So when we got together with our uh, guided coalition and started to talk about, hey, what are the things that are important to you? Uh, that 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 we can make an immediate impact at, at Northside High School on, and and we we went in the lab and we came up with these five areas. We all agreed that we wanted to put students first, so that's our very first co collective commitment. We put students first. We wanted to focus on their learning. That's number two. We want to support each other as a staff. That's number three. We want to commit to growth. We want to have a growth mindset. That's number four. And then finally, we want to follow instructions. OK, now, as we sat there, we, we decided that those five collective commitments are five collective commitments that we use for all of our stakeholder groups. So we just simply put the mascot in front of them. Grizzlies put students first. Grizzlies focus on their learning. Grizzlies support each other. Grizzlies commit to growth and Grizzlies follow instructions. And, and that has been very, very influential and, and impactful on our journey to take some situations that needed addressing and try to make them better. All right. So let's talk about the implementation process of this, Jason, because, you know, it's, it's great to have these commitments that we have established. You said there was five of them. And so, you know, what does that look like as far as, you know, is it something that's visible everywhere? Is it something that your teachers come back to? You know, what is changing the culture of your school with these collective commitments? 
So it's an absolutely work in progress. Like I would love to tell you that it was a magic one that you put them up on a wall somewhere and everything works, right? But that's not reality. In reality, what we started to do is we we really honed in on put students first. Now, what does that look like? We had a we had a district initiative. One of our four major rocks, you know how that works, right? Was capturing kids' hearts. And and I love that program. Shout out. I'm not trying to promote anybody, but we do that in our district. So but in capturing kids hearts, what we what we found was the more present we were and the more we connected to students, the better it would be to help them reach their potential. And so we really honed in on being out in the hallways, in the doorway when a student is coming in the, in the, in the room and, and speaking to them and, and creating that first initial contact. And then we we made that a priority. Put students first, cr- create relationships. And we just honed in on it. Administrators out in the hallways, being encouraging, loving on people, c- uh, creating relationships, positive relationships. And we, and we were relentless and are relentless on that right there. So that's really our what we hang our hat on is putting those students first. And then as we started to really get some traction on putting students first, we started to look at systems that we had that we could help with focusing on their learning. Number one, specifically having an objective up in the classroom. So we want you to be in the classroom. We want you to see that student when they're coming in the door, but we also want that student when they sit down in that environment is they see what you want them to learn and why you want them to learn it. And so we as administrators went in all those classrooms repeatedly checking for those objectives, making sure those objectives was on the board, not out of compliance, but out of compassion. Right. And out of commitment. So and that's really how we started to build that whole process of putting those collective uh, commitments into to play. So I want to know about the back end of things also. Obviously, as an administrator, like you said, it's getting in those classrooms, but it's also having those conversations with maybe instructional coaches, maybe with your teachers about how this is incorporated, not only with the relationship with the student, which is obviously very important. And I'm so glad <laughs> that's the first thing on that <laughs> right. list. But then, right. you know, we've also got to, you know, look at the objectives and, and mastery. And so, you know, are you trying to embed this into converse- conversations and meetings with your staff also? Well, absolutely. So we're very intentional about every conversation we have. We lean it back to our collective commitments. Right. We ask questions. We ask clarifying questions. For example, we and you use the word mastery, which that's a whole different. That's that's a two hour. That's a two hour track right there. But but at the end of the semester, we run. Everybody runs those great reports. And when we looked and we saw an increased number of S, well, how do we have that conversation? We bring them in. Okay. Or we put in students first. Is a homework assignment or behavior concept putting students first, right? Now, focus on learning. Mastery. Do we know what the students know? Are, are, they, are they doing what we've asked them to do? Do they understand the information? Right. And then we have that conversation when I'm having that conversation or we're having that conversation with a, with a staff member is, hey, listen, remember, we focus on our learning. And is that a focus on Learnville? Uh, is that are we putting them first? Most importantly, are we supporting them? Are we supporting them in every aspect? Have we called a parent? Have we have we talked to a counselor? Have we gotten an administrator involved? Have we talked to one of their uh, club activity sponsors? Do we know who their best friends are? Are we are we locked in and connected? And if we are, we can support them. And then I know you hate the concept of mastery, maybe teacher, but you you we have to be committed to growth. Right. We have to take steps in that direction. And if, if when we go through all four of those and we still hadn't hit home, then we say Grizzlies follow directions. And we're going to do master at Northside High School. <laughs> so I love it. So, Jason, I want to talk about that that three pronged piece. Right. We always talk about, mm-hmm. you know, the staff, we talk about the students. But then, of course, we've got the parents and maybe slash community members. So, you know, right. in your communication to the commitments, what was your way of getting that information out to the parents and guardians and how is their response to the commitments once you communicated that out well the the very first thing you know school gives us school whoever came up the school calendar they were brilliant a lot more brilliant than i they're going to give us some opportunities at the very beginning of school 
ninth grade freshman transition, right? We created the entire transition around put students first based on the Caption Kids Heart model. And we talk to parents on the first, when they first get into the ninth grade, the parents are involved with that conversation and they begin, to, we begin to train that group. Now for the ones that were on campus that, that, that were there before we got there, right? What we did was it took some time for us to try to start getting that, 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 um, you know, momentum going, but then parent teacher conference is coming at the end of September or at the beginning of October. So now you got a newsletter. You, you have an opportunity to stand in front of those parents and remind them what's going on. We encourage those teachers as they're going around the table to table that, hey, you talk about the collective commitments that we have here. We need your help. We need your help putting your student first. We need your help with focusing on learning. We need your help with supporting your students, right? We need your help with committing to growth, right? And 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 it, it's not, it's not, like I said, it's not a silver bullet, but it's it's just an everyday commitment to making sure that we adhere to those collective commitments that we have decided as a staff. Yeah, it's that buy-in piece. You got to make sure that they're on board yeah. with the commitments just as much as your students and your staff. So love that communication piece. You know, Jason, you had talked about just being a part of education for quite some time, right? 20 years. Right. So right. I want to know, you know, in going into leadership, what were some things that you found beneficial in changing the culture in addition to the collective commitments? You know, I tell you, coaches, I was a coach. I coached basketball yep. and I spent some time in college athletics uh, as an academic coordinator at the University of Arkansas for men's basketball and at Clemson University in the same role. What I learned was the you can never over communicate. Right. So I took those principles of over communication on the basketball court defensively, offensively how I spoke to parents, how I talked to teachers, you know, on behalf or, or in with, in conjunction with, and I, and that has been the most beneficial thing that I've taken as a leader is understanding that the relationship matters, that communicating with them matters and active listening is important. Not listening to give them a response, but listening to understand where they're coming from. Understanding that you may not be able to give them exactly what they want, but 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 you did give them your attention, which, which speaks to respect. And the respect factor, especially in our communities, is very, very vital on getting any kind of buy-in or support. So let's hone in on that a little bit more because <laughs> you know, being a coach myself, I'm, I'm shaking my head vigorously. But I know right. I took a lot of things from the coaching world and, and trying to manage so many people. It, it kind of right. made it a little bit easier to get into leadership and, and kind of do it at a building mm -hmm. level. So I'm just curious about like those conversations. So you had talked about like coaching conversations and building that relationship. What are some key right. factors that you felt were beneficial when maybe having a crucial conversation with someone when you identify some needs that may need to change? Well, when you build relationships, authenticity is important. And so, so what I use is I use a formula with everyone. If, if it's a situation that I'm in charge of in terms of leading the conversation, then I lead with, here is what, how this conversation is going to lay out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address what some of the concerns are or what the situation is, if it's not a concern. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to, to give your perspective on this particular situation. Then we're going to talk about what the next steps are. So when I do that, if, if it's a, if it's a, a parent concern, then I may let them go first. Cause you don't want to, you don't want to go and then open up another can of worms, right? You want to have some patience in that situation. But if it's a, if it's a teacher, then what I do is I want to get them very quickly into the conversation and let them understand that this is coaching. Right. That this is not a situation that we want. We want to build you. We don't have the opportunity. We don't have the resources. We don't have the time to keep going out and getting new teachers. <laughs> right. It'd be more advantageous to us to invest in what you are doing. So as long as you have effort, then I can help you. As long as you're willing to be coachable, then we can get in the right direction. And I'm. In, it's a us thing. It's a we thing. It's not a me against you thing. And so I don't know if I really answered your question in the way that you wanted me to, but, but that, that's how I do it. <laughs> no, I, I'm, 
I'm laughing here because it's true. I mean, I, I would constantly tell my staff, like, especially our younger teachers, like, I don't expect you to be a perfect product. Like, this is about growth. It's about being better, mm -hmm. similar to what you were talking about with the students. And so I love the fact that you're thinking, you know, and communicating, hey, I'm not trying to get rid of you. I'm not trying to get you out the door. I'm just trying to make you a better version of yourself. And um, uh, yeah, I was just thinking to just communication is so vital in leadership. And it's something that I don't feel like we're prepared for and we kind of have to do a trial and error and you know you're talking about like letting the pa parents speak first and the, and i'm thinking of so many opportunities where i didn't do that when i was young in my leadership and then kicking myself like oh this conversation went off the rails <laughs> this is That's not right. what i expected it's always a, they, they, there can always be a curveball mm -hmm. and the more you know before you speak the better you can craft what you need to say Sometimes you got to sometimes you got to go in there and just take the bullet, like take the beating from the parents. Right. But but be solution oriented. Right. And, and you know, what I do, for example, if it's a classroom walkthrough from me, then the teacher is going to hear from me within 48 hours. And when they hear from me, it's going to be a glow. I'm going to find something that they did right. Right. And then we're also going to talk about what their perspective was. What did they see? Right. What? How did they see it unfolding? And then I'm going to use the terminology that we talk about when our collective commitments. I'm going to talk to them through examples from our test uh, evalu evaluative system. It, but but I, I use the wrong word It's teacher excellence support system. Right. So so it's not evaluation. It's excellence. And I hone in on that. If it's a, if it's a classroom management, then I'm going to say, hey, 2C is classroom management. Here are some things that you can do to help you immediately improve in this area. My favorite one is 3A, communication. You, how do you communicate with students? How do you explain or what you expect for them to learn? How do you use directions and activities to get them where they need to go? And how do you know they did that? How do you explain content? What are you doing with your verbal and written instructions? That's the ball game. That's the whole ball game right there. That's where the learning is. So, so, and I share that with teachers, you know? Well, I think there's a couple of fantastic things that you said, Jason, is one, the immediate feedback, mm -hmm. but then also like presenting it in a way that you're providing a positive component to that. <laughs> so it's not just a, a beat down of what I didn't do, but then also that self-reflection piece. Cause I think it's important to have the teacher's voice in that mm -hmm. to understand what was done well or needed improvement in that lesson. And then uh, the last thing is, you know, tying it back to the, the system itself and having evidence to support that. So um, some great pieces there for those who are trying to give feedback to teachers and, and help that growth. Um, Jason, I'm going to pivot real quick because I want to make sure that we touch on something that is very personal to you and I think is probably a good resource for those who are listening. So you have a encouragement devotional coming out. It's a 90 day piece of resource here for folks. So would you mind just kind of sharing what that's all about, but then also who was it created for? Okay. So this, this devotional, I I've been wanting to write for a while and, and October 8th was my birthday. It is my birthday. And I kind of got, you know, God kind of talked to me and said, listen, if you'll sit down and write, then I'll give you the words by your mother's birthday, which is December the 8th. And then you can publish it by your daddy's birthday, which is February 26th. Right. And, and so without going into all of that, I sat down and started writing these devotionals. They're about 300 words. It, it comes with a, a weekly topic. For example, you are not alone. So you are not alone would be the topic for the entire week, five days. And then there's a daily theme, Monday, motivation, Tuesday, training, Wednesday, worship, Thursday, thankful Thursday and fast Friday. And then you get you get a uh, you get a passage. So it'll say your moment. The first one in there is your moment. And it's a story about my about my um, uh, trials and tribulations on my way to getting the doctor, the doctorate. And, and it, I tell a story about the morning of the defense with my wife and my kids and our journey there and those types of things. And then you get an antidote, then you get a reflection. And then every one of them, every one of them starts, uh, ends with the second mile has your moment, right? And the second mile is about Matthew 5 and 41. Uh, it, to, if a person forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now, it's for everyone, right? It's for the five-day work week. 
But I came up with this concept. Uh, it's not mine. I didn't create the second mile. Right. But I came up with it when I was the building principal uh, and and we had a district initiative, uh, the, the, the uh, energy bus at the time. And the high schoolers felt like that was that was not that was a little uh, elementary for them, so to speak. Right. So I had to try to have a growth mindset and have something that they could that they could tie to and the staff could tie to. So I came up with second mile service. And and we we hashtagged everything second mile service. They come in, hashtag second mile, second mile service. We just put all the all the things inside of the energy bus in that concept. Uh, and, and so it's, 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 it's going to be on Amazon. I self-published. You can do anything by yourself now, you know, with YouTube. So <laughs> yes, <for sure. laughs> that's right. All so, right. Well, I'm very excited it. about that. Yes. And we'll make sure we will put the link in there. Um, once it drops, um, in the show notes and definitely on YouTube, uh, Jason, I want to talk just about some advice, right? Because it's fantastic mm -hmm. that they're here listening to your wisdom about collective commitments and how to change the culture on a campus. But I also want them to have actionable items to help them, you know, amplify their learning. That's right. And amplify their leadership journey. So for those who are listening, if they can do something tomorrow, next week, you know, what would you advise them to do to, to become a better leader? If, if you're a teacher leader, I would advise you to dive into the curriculum. Be the person in the room that's reading the curriculum, that understands the curriculum, understands the relationship between curriculum, instruction and assessment and, and, and be someone that we look at as a, a leading person in that area, because that, that's going to gain respect from your colleagues. If you're a young administrator, just be quiet and listen. <laughs> and, and and what I mean by that is not listen to, uh, to Jason Williamson, but but we get into those re those leadership roles and, and we just go fast, fast, fast. And we want to prove that we belong. Well, you already proved Jeff, that you belong because you're there. You didn't get there by accident. So it's OK to slow down, be quiet and listen and, and find those things uh, that 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 you are that, that are your strengths. And, and work on those things that you need to grow in uh, and, and understand most importantly that you are an instructional leader in the building. If you are five to 10 years, which is where I am, you know, start to really start to really stretch yourself uh, in, in the areas that, that you need to grow in. And if that's master scheduling, if you have the master schedule, then get in with the master schedule and, and, and learn the master schedule. If, if that's understanding how to do more restorative justice in, in within your discipline policy, then then do that. But but what can happen when you become an assistant principal is you can get locked into one thing because you're good at it, but you don't grow as a leader. Right. And we need well-rounded leaders that that can push the needle forward for all of our stakeholders. Yep. If you're comfortable, you're not growing. So. Make That's sure you're right. getting in that uncomfortable. And I could have used a Dr. Williamson talking to me as a young leader to say, shut your mouth and listen. Because <laughs> I was me too. a million, That's how I know. million, miles, <laughs> a million <laughs> miles an hour. With, that was my problem. Goodness. That's right. All right. So, Jason, I, I just want folks to not only eat up this information that you provided, but connect with you on social media. So how can they right. connect with you on the various platforms? That is an area of growth for me, right? You know, I say you, you, know, you know how to grow. So I am, I am growing. Uh, my Twitter handle, I can say that right, is J Williamson seven one three. J Williamson seven one three. I am on LinkedIn at Jason Williamson, and um, I now because I've written the, the the devotional, I am my intent is to have secondmilehub.com coming soon, very soon. Uh, my wife came up with the hub idea. So shout out uh, Shelly Williamson. Better say something about all my kids. I got two kids. <laughs> Cassius Williamson. He's at the University of Michigan as a junior. And Caius Williamson, who's the smartest Williamson, who is a 10th grader now at Northside High School with me. But but that, that's how you find me. Jay Williamson, 713. Uh, and, um, you know, secondmilehub.com is coming. Awesome. Well, just for everyone that's watching on YouTube, you're probably looking at Jason saying he might be the best dressed guest I've ever had <laughs> on the podcast. 
<laughs> but then also I will have all the links um, for Jason on my website, joshtammer.com. So make sure you're going there. As soon as the book drops too, we'll make sure that link's in, in there for you all. And then of course the website too, we can definitely put that on there. And then for those who are watching on YouTube, appreciate it. Uh, make sure you're pr pressing that subscribe button. Joshua Stamper is the channel. Or you can head over to Teach Better's YouTube channel that is also a growing community. Jason, I just want to thank you so much for like I said before, just sharing so much information, wisdom with our listeners on the power of culture and what you're doing with those collective commitments. Because I, I really do think that's a, a wonderful strategy that a lot of people can implement. And it gives a kind of a baseline for everyone coming in as far as all stakeholders, students, staff, parents, community. And uh, man, I'm just appreciative of your time so much today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. <laughs>